quickly our next speaker, who is uh, Professor van der Linden, um, who will present his talk, A Psychological Vaccine Against Misinformation About Climate. So Professor Sander van der Linden is a professor of social psychology in society and director of the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cambridge. He is the editor in chief of the journal Environmental Psychology. Before joining Cambridge, he held academic positions at Princeton, Yale, and the London School of Economics. He has won numerous awards for his research on human judgment, communication, and decision making, especially in the context of climate change, including the Rising Star Award from the Association for Psychological Science and the Sir James Cameron Medal for the Public Understanding of Risk from the Royal College of Physicians. His research papers have appeared in numerous academic journals and are regularly featured featured in media such as the New York Times and the BBC. Uh, so let's welcome Professor van der Linden. I wanted to ask you, uh, do you want to take questions at the end of your talk or do you want to pause? Um, I'm happy to do it at the end of the talk. That might be easier, yeah. Let's when, do it at uh, the end of the talk then. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's fine. When will the end be so that I can just time it on my computer? Yeah, so I'm like just encouraging people to keep sending the questions in the chat. We're going to start at 10.55. Should I just jump in? Yes, go ahead. Uh, you're welcome to uh, share your share screen and, and jump in in your presentation. Excellent. Can you see this? Yes. All right. So I've, yeah, I've titled it Psychological Inoculation Against Climate Information. I mean, the vaccine metaphor, I really like the vaccine metaphor, but, but uh, I don't want to mislead people that it's akin to a biological vaccine, of course, but uh, um, as I hope to explore, there, there are some similarities uh, between the analogy and, uh, and what we can do psychologically that are interesting to consider when it comes to uh, countering uh, disinformation. So I'm not, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about what is fake news and disinformation. I just want to highlight that, you know, according to some, some of the common definitions that at least we've been using that when I talk about this topic, I, I often mean disinformation or the purposeful spread of incorrect information with an intent to, to harm or deceive people. So I'm not talking so much about misinformation or just, you know, false information, including errors, but more about disinformation and, and propaganda uh, when I use the term fake news uh, interchangeably, as, as most people do. So, you know, there, there's a large literature, of course, on how to combat misinformation and disinformation. And there are a lot of good meta-analyses out uh, on, on some of those measures. And the most common way to do this is through fact-checking and debunking. And I think, you know, Steve Lewandowski and John Cook, of course, who are also giving a talk today, uh, have, have co-authored the, the new debunking handbook uh, along with, with many others. And I saw, you know, Gail's in the chat and, and a few others as well, um, where we sort of outlined, uh, you know, if you're going to debunk, what are, what are the good ways of, of effectively debunking? Um, so I think that's, that's useful. I think fact-checking is useful insofar it sends an incentive to politicians that there are people, you know, out there watching you, even when the fact checks aren't always sort of uh, effective. But a large literature also shows that once people are exposed to a falsehood or a myth, they continue to retrieve false information from memory. So they continue to rely on falsehoods and make inferences, um, even when they acknowledge uh, corrections very explicitly. And this is called the continued influence of misinformation. And, um, you know, that's, I think, one of the big drawbacks of, of when you're trying to come at this issue uh, after people have already been exposed to a myth. Um, and, uh, when it comes to fact checking, you know what's what's useful here um, is that fact checks can reach people, but they often don't reach as many people as the original piece of misinformation. So fact checks don't scale as much as the original uh, misinformation that's out there. So it's often sort of too little, uh, too late. And I think so. Although we have some resources, uh, it's limited in, in what it can do. And that's where really uh, I became interested in the uh, the vaccination metaphor. Um, and the idea that we can vaccinate people beforehand. And this goes back to a social psychological theory called inoculation theory, which was pioneered by Bill McGuire in the 1960s. And he did some interesting experiments on the idea that you could preemptively uh, immunize people uh, against persuasion. Uh, they never really tested it in the context of 
uh, misinformation and disinformation, but the, the metaphor was uh, was there and, and some interesting work was was being done. Uh, and in fact, in, in social psychology, people have written throughout the 90s that, you know, it was a clever metaphor, but but many questions were left unanswered. And so we wanted to pick up uh, where uh, psychology left off. And I'll briefly explain the metaphor now for those of you who are not familiar with the theory, just as with real vaccines, when you expose people to a weakened dose of a falsehood, um, just a little bit of the virus. So weakened dose, people can build up psychological or mental, mental antibodies uh, against them uh, over time. And so you do that psychologically through the process of forewarning people that there is a threat to their attitudes or their knowledge uh, and a cognitive basis is what we call reputational preemption. Um, so you preemptively refute a piece of misinformation that people are about to see. An easier way to refer to this is just uh, pre-bunking. And so this uh, triggers a process of rehearsal uh, through uh, essentially through which people generate these cognitive or mental antibodies uh, over time so that they become more resistant uh, to infection when they're actually exposed uh, to a manipulation attempt in the future. Uh, and so that's where it's similar to the vaccination metaphor. Um, now, we started researching this actually in the context of climate change. So that's why it's very relevant. And we published some, some research to see if it's possible to preemptively immunize people against misinformation about climate change. And the way we did this, uh, now of course the, the, the news kind of described it as a, as a fake news vaccine. Um, some journalists even call this and, and ask us if it was fake news. I don't think it's fake news, uh, but there are some, some interesting results. Um, now, I think why the context of climate change is so interesting and important is because there have been concerted disinformation campaigns uh, on the issue of, of climate change happening for decades. And of course, Naomi Oreskes is at, at Harvard, uh, who's a science historian, has documented this in her book, Merchants of Doubt, uh, but also in her documentary uh, uh, that's called uh, uh, Manufacturing or Merchants of Doubt. It's a great, great film, um, if you're not familiar with it. Um, and there they really highlight the techniques that have been used um, by the fossil fuel industry to essentially and deliberately mislead people on the issue of climate change. And there are parallels here with the tobacco and the fossil fuel industry, some of the same techniques of sowing doubt about the scientific consensus in particular um, have been used by different actors. And this is where we got the idea that, oh, that's interesting. You know, there, there are these same techniques that are being recycled and, and, and practiced by actors to try to mislead people. Um, and so can you preemptively vaccinate people against some of these uh, manipulation techniques? So in particular, there was a memo that was leaked from uh, Frank Luntz, who's a political strategist uh, for the Republican Party, um, who wrote a, a memo to the Bush administration that said, um, voters believe that there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Uh, should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate. Um, now, of course, Frank Luntz has recently testified, in fact, uh, saying that you know he, he was wrong at the time and now he's ready to use his political uh, persuasion uh, to, to get people on board with climate change. Uh, but at the time, you know, this is what he was advising. And in a separate line of research, we've, we've found that you know, some of this is, in fact, unfortunately, is true that, you know, when you expose people um, to negative information about the scientific consensus on climate change, people do change their views accordingly. And also when you expose them to positive messages about the scientific consensus, people change other related beliefs accordingly. And this is what we call the gateway belief, but um, that's sort of a separate model. Um, but here we, we, we focus on this issue because it's easy for people to remember. It's an easy fact. Um, and so we could we could use as the facts in our experiment here that you know there is a scientific consensus on climate change most scientists agree uh, and see how people respond and then attack that uh, with a misinformation technique. Um, so what I'm showing you here are the results of an experiment with a few thousand people on mTurk. It was it was a fairly big you know diverse sample. We asked people you know to estimate the scientific consensus on climate change uh, before. Uh, the experiments at the pretest, and then again at the end with some distractors in between. We also asked them to estimate consensus on other issues about, you know, Angelina Jolie and uh, other things that were topical in the news so that people didn't, you know, catch on that this was an experiment about climate change. Um, and what you see here is an effects only condition. So if people just saw the scientific consensus, 
people update their beliefs towards the consensus, right? Fairly uncontroversial. You show people facts, you know, most scientists agree, people update towards the facts. Now, of course, you can say that's not realistic. People don't operate in a facts only uh, media environment. So what happens when you expose people to misinformation? So we expose people to the Oregon Global Warming Petition. This is a real website, a real petition that says that, oh, you know, 30,000 American scientists signed this petition saying that uh, global warming isn't happening. Um, and this petition is completely bogus. You know, it's been debunked, uh, and, but it's a real website. So we expose people to sort of a screenshot of, uh, of the website. Uh, and then, you know, you see a, a big negative effect. So people downgrade uh, their judgments uh, of the scientific consensus once they've been exposed to misinformation, perhaps not too surprising. Then we had a condition where we showed the two cues side by side. Um, so this is uh, mirroring false media balance, right? Where you often have two sides being presented in the media. And shockingly, what you see here is that the introduction uh, of contrarian information, so the introduction of, of, of anything dissenting the consensus just canceled out the power of facts completely. So you see here that there was a big sort of positive influence of facts uh, that was completely canceled out uh, when you put misinformation uh, in fact, side by side, which was kind of worrying. And so our question was, could we preemptively immunize people uh, against this petition, against the techniques that are being used um, and prevent this from happening? So in one condition, we just forewarned people, this is kind of the partial vaccine. So we said, you know, there's actors out there trying to mislead you on the issue of climate change, you know, you gotta be careful. Uh, and then another condition, which was a more detailed sort of inoculation, uh, we told people, uh, and this contains the preemptive refutation or the pre-bunk, which said, oh, you might come across a petition, uh, but you know, you, this thing is total sort of bogus. You know, people who have signed it include uh, Charles Darwin and the Spice Girls. Um, and so, you know, you shouldn't buy into it. And that's where we found that, you know, both the partial and the full vaccination were effective insofar it preserved about one thirds uh, and two thirds uh, of the treatment effect uh, from the fact-based condition. So it was a D of about 0 0.3 uh, to, to, to 0 0.4. Um, in terms of uh, preserving uh, some of the uh, consensus effect, so that which was quite positive. Again, so it's not a full, you know, immunization, not a full inoculation, uh, but it's a, it's a, you know, it was a pretty good boost. And what's so interesting is that you see the same pattern across ideology and across prior beliefs as well. Um, so it didn't matter what people's prior beliefs on climate were. It didn't matter what their party ID was. Um, now, of course, here you can see if you were Republican on this particular issue, we know that you're more skeptical. So if you were shown uh, both cues side by side, you were more likely to lean towards the perspective that you already agree with. Um, so there's a bit of confirmation bias, for example, here. But in the inoculation conditions, we see the same pattern uh, across all groups. So all groups were protected regardless of what their prior beliefs uh, were, uh, which we think is a very positive result. Maybe no one wants to be duped uh, regardless of what your politics are. Now, uh, I want to talk about this because, uh, you know, John, Cook uh, can talk, you know, perhaps he, he'll talk about it in his presentation. They did a very similar experiment, uh, also using the same uh, petition uh, and found some really promising uh, results too that I'll defer to, to John on. Uh, but basically it was, you know, uh, verifying some of the initial findings that we found. Um, Steve and I just put out a review on misinformation and pre-bunking. So if you're interested in this, we go into these studies in detail, the climate studies uh, in this review. Um, so you can also read about it there. And we also have a, a new review out um, of inoculation applied to, to all sorts of uh, contested science findings. Um, but we were left after this with some, some interesting practical questions. So people asked us, um, okay, so you've vaccinated people against a particular myth how do you scale this? You know, what can you do to actually scale this? So um, is there a way to go from a narrow spectrum sort of vaccination to a more broad spectrum vaccination? Um, is there a way that, uh, how long does it last? Um, and, and how does it factor with, you know, people who have different beliefs on the issue? And so these were all good questions. Um, and um, we were particularly interested in, in terms of scaling this and answering the question, well, can we do something more interesting with the the virtual needle? You know, most people don't are not necessarily interested in science. So, is there a way to actively inoculate people? And actively inoculating means letting people generate their own antibodies rather than being passively handed the uh, the, the, the preemptive refutation. So, a traditional passive inoculation, which is 99% of of prior inoculation scholarship, is basically giving people the counter arguments beforehand. Whereas active inoculation is 
letting people generate the counter arguments themselves. And the idea is that it strengthens, you know, connections in memory and that it's more convincing for people and that they become more resistant. Um, but I want to start out with the, the longevity question, and I'll come back to that later too, is we decided to replicate our, our climate study and now make one crucial change. Instead of attacking people directly after they've been exposed in the same experiment, we decided to delay the attack for a week. Um, and so we wanted to see uh, if the inoculation would still confer protection a week after. Um, kind of like, you know, I just got my Pfizer uh, jab and you have to wait a few weeks to build up the antibodies. Um, and so it's the same idea that uh, maybe people build up antibodies over time um, and, and, you know, does it still hold after um, a week? So the, the setup was actually the same as the original study. Uh, with one crucial difference. So we had our control group, the, the false balance consensus group, uh, the, the consensus only group, or the fact only, and then the inoculation group. Uh, there's only one difference, is that there was a, a one week delay uh, in all conditions, uh, after which people were exposed to the misinformation, and then we tested them uh, again. And so what do we find in time one? Of course, uh, here, this sample was smaller and uh, not as diverse. This was a prolific academic sample. But basically against control, you see that, you know, in all conditions that featured a consensus treatment, people, you know, adjust their estimate of the consensus upward. So that's a positive trend. Um, and there's no misinformation present at this point, right? Just, it's just a positive uh, misinformation. Uh, so that's fairly clear. But then after people are attacked, what you see is that the inoculation condition uh, is significantly, of course, higher than the false balance condition where people weren't uh, uh, inoculated beforehand, uh, also against control, but it's about the same as the consensus only condition. And so you can interpret that in, in a variety of ways. Uh, one is that um, the consensus message by itself decays over the course of one week a little bit, right? So the effect is a bit smaller than it was one week ago, but the inoculation, uh, is not statistically different from the consensus treatment here. So that means that you know, it, it preserves some of the same effect uh, as giving people a consensus treatment without exposure to the misinformation. So these people were not exposed to, uh, to misinformation, right? So you're achieving sort of the same effect uh, as the consensus treatment. So one way of thinking about this is, is that it doesn't decay uh, over time, right? So the effect of the inoculation uh, has kind of remained uh, constant uh, compared to the consensus treatment, which did decay. Um, but the, I think the takeaway is that the inoculation was still effective after, uh, even after uh, one week in the sort of attack delay. Now, um, our next question really was, how could we scale this and implement it in the real world and, and make this more fun and engaging for people? And I borrow a quote here from uh, Professor Severus Snape, who said, your defenses must therefore be as flexible and inventive uh, as the arts that you seek to undo. And I think, you know, what he's trying to get at is that, you know, the dark arts of manipulation are evolving. We see that in the misinformation and the disinformation space too. So I really like this quote. It's about uh, us being as creative and inventive uh, as some of the uh, manipulators out there. And one way for us to do that was through gamifying this approach. And so we created a game together with a gaming company uh, called Bad News. And Bad News is a social media simulation, which essentially uh, takes people through a cognitive simulation uh, with social features of what it's like to be exposed uh, to some of these manipulation tactics. So people step into the shoes of a misinformation producer, in fact, for a few minutes and are exposed and forewarned uh, to weakened doses of the key uh, techniques that are used to manipulate people online. And so it's the same principle, but it's more general uh, and it's uh, in a simulated environment. So it's more realistic. So people actually feel like they're on social media. Um, so John Rosenbeek, who's a postdoc in my lab, you know, helped create this game. And uh, you can see here being amused with uh, questions from CNN about how it works. Um, we've changed the scenarios now. So let me just give you some examples. This was during the Trump era. Um, so you, you, you impersonate Donald Trump. This is part of what we call the impersonation technique, which includes things like fake experts and, uh, you know, fake climate experts and so on. After long deliberation with my generals, I've decided to declare war on North Korea, hashtag Kim Jong-un. And so you start tweeting this, you gain followers, and the goal is not to lose credibility, because if you're being too crazy, then uh, you don't get any points. Um, but your goal is to spread fake news like a 
online manipulator would of, of misinformation um, in a way that uses, you know, weakened doses of these techniques. And when I say weakened, we made it so ridiculous that it's obvious that it's fake, but you still get the point across. And so it's kind of like, you know, the dose is weakened enough for people to start producing antibodies and to pay attention, but not so strong to actually do people, of course. And then you tweet, you know, the mainstream media is one massive conspiracy, hashtag fake news. You get followers, you get replies. So here you're impersonating NASA, a large space object set to hit the US West Coast, hashtag be safe. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interactive and people respond to you and you get followers and you can sort of see how it works here. Uh, let me take you through our climate module for a second so you see how the, the climate module operates. So, for example, now you, you come across a headline that says, ooh, climate change could have serious negative impact on our way of life. That's what scientists are saying. And so now you're learning about how scientists are attacked uh, in the media and what strategies are being used to attack scientists. So you engage in this yourself. So it's an active inoculation to try to prevent you or help you spot these techniques in, in real life. And so you start attacking it and you say, let's attack those scientists, eggheads, uh, choose your weapon. And so you're making a meme and then he says, oh, science says climate will change, but they can't even predict rain, right? And so this gets at a particular technique um, that uses, uh, you know, our ability to predict the weather, to say something about, cl to discredit climate scientists. And you tweet this and you gain followers. And so you learn about the techniques of, of deception uh, in a way that hopefully immunizes people. And so there's these various techniques. There's polarization, impersonation, conspiracy theories, trolling, emotion, and uh, discrediting. And uh, people go through the levels and then they obtain a badge before they move on to the next phase. And then they get a certificate at the end. And so the way we tested uh, some of these results is through uh, initially a pre-post survey in the game. So people were exposed to simulated social media headlines like this one. So stuff people haven't been exposed to in the game, but use the same technique. So this uses the same technique of, of manipulating the Twitter handle. So Trump had an N instead of an M. And here we've manipulated the umlaut on the O. Uh, this was during Game of Thrones. Eighth season of hashtag Game of Thrones will be postponed to a salary dispute. This was total fake news that we made up, but we asked people how reliable they find it before and after to see if they can now spot the disinformation uh, techniques. Um, here's Johnson Crude Oil tweeting, hey Leo, it's snowing and freezing in New York. Could use some of that global warming you're always going on about. And so what we're hoping to see here is that people can recognize that this is part of the trolling technique. So this person, you know, crude oil is trolling Leo about uh, climate change. And so hopefully people find it less reliable once they've been inoculated against the trolling technique. So we published a paper on this a few years ago with about 15,000 people. Was it within subject design? Um, so you can see here on the credible news headlines, people didn't change, people found credible news reliable uh, at the beginning and also after playing, but they significantly re rated the reliability of fake news uh, as less reliable for each of these techniques uh, afterwards. And this was true um, for the whole sort of distribution here. Um, and, you know, there were some tiny differences in ideology and age and, and education, but mostly all groups showed an improvement pre-post in their ability to recognize these um, techniques. Okay, now we decided to do a randomized replication of this in a between subject or a mixed design where we both had between conditions as well as pre-post. And so we randomized people to either Tetris or control game. So they played a control gamified sort of, you know, condition for about 20 minutes versus our treatment. Um, and this was published in uh, Journal of Cognition uh, not too long ago. Uh, and we used a, a much larger number of headlines. Initially, we started out with headlines that we made up to control for memory confounds, right? If you use real fake news, uh, people might have seen it before and they know it's true or not from memory, right? And so we wanted to control for memory confounds. So we created our own series of headlines for this uh, to mimic real fake news, of course. Um, and this is the average index of, of how people, how reliable people find fake news and disinformation, you know, including items about climate. And on the whole, in the treatment group, people find misinformation less reliable, but it also boosted their confidence. And so only when people's uh, prejudgments were correct, by the way, about whether or not um, it was reliable, um, which is important because if you're not very confident in what you believe, uh, you're easily persuaded. So we found that the intervention also boosted people's uh, confidence. Now, the final sort of set of studies I want to talk about 
um, return to the longevity question. So we wanted to see, okay, well, these effects are cool. We're immunizing people against the larger techniques. Uh, how long does this effect actually last? And so here you see another example of our news item. So raw news at one, again, this is a made up source to avoid source confounds. Um, scientists discovered solution to greenhouse effect years ago, but aren't allowed to publish it, report claims. Now this is part of the conspiracy technique. And so, you know, Steve talked about conspiracy theories. Uh, and so here we wanted to see if people now find this less reliable because they can identify this as a conspiracy theory. Um, uh, so this was published last year in three experiments. I won't go into too much detail, uh, but I'll, I'll sort of explain the basic setup. So most of our experiments are the same. So we have a pretest where we assess people on these items, then we randomize them either to the inoculation or the control group. Then they complete a post-test of the same items. Um, so we look at the change score uh, in each group. And then uh, the difference here is that one week later, we started following up with people by giving them another set of misinformation items uh, week after week after week for about three months because we wanted to see how long the effect actually lasts. So we did this on a weekly basis. Uh, then in the second group, we did the same, but we didn't follow up with people in between. We just followed up with people at the very end. And in the third group, we decided to just uh, change the items at every iteration because, you know, some clever reviewers were saying, well, maybe it's just that people are memorizing the items because they're using the same items over time. So we changed up the items. So here's generally what we find. At, at the beginning, there is no difference um, because uh, this is a pretest. Then after the intervention, you see a difference between treatment uh, and control. Um, at, at T2, so after playing the game. Uh, and this effect was maintained week after week after week for about two months. So we thought, well, this, you know, this is a bit suspicious because, you know, even, even the COVID vaccine, you know, you have to get a second shot to obtain a full immunity. Um, so when we looked at the data for the second study, what we found was that the effect, in fact, does decay over time. So this is the third, so this is without any inter, in, intermediate sort of testing. This is at the very end. There's still a significant effect, but it decayed from, um, from the second time point. And so what we hypothesized was going on here is that when you actually repeatedly contact people and have them assess misinformation, you're actually boosting their immune response uh, by re-engaging uh, with the techniques of, of disinformation and maybe helping people retrieve the lessons that they've learned. And so we figured that you can actually maintain people's immunity pretty well by boosting them uh, regularly on a weekly basis. But if you don't do that, um, there does seem to be decay of the uh, inoculation effect over time. Uh, there were no differences in our experiments that use different or the same items. So actually we, we were able to rule out item <clears throat> sensitization uh, or the fact that people might get sensitized to the items. We have some technical papers if you're interested on, on disentangling item and testing effects in our interventions. Uh, I won't go into that now, um, but we decided to sort of scale this idea further. So we worked with the UK government to translate this intervention into pretty much every language around the world. So it's available in every major language. Um, and we did some cross-cultural sort of testing in, in Sweden and Germany and Greece and Poland. And on average, basically, we find that in our within subject, you know, within game designs, people improve pretty well on, on spotting manipulation techniques. Uh, we were lucky to win some awards. It was in a museum for a while. Um, here you see one victim uh, who's, who's playing the game, uh, which, you know, undoubtedly is all due to the game designers and, and the graphic artists and, and all sorts of other people who were uh, part of this collaboration. Uh, we won some, some uh, awards in the Netherlands uh, for, for the game. You can see John Rosenbeek collecting a, a prize for sort of the innovation of, of, of gamifying this approach. We have a version for kids called Bat News Junior, uh, which is much more age appropriate. So uh, basically it's SpongeBob uh, and, and you're impersonating a high school principal and, and you're spreading fake news that schools out, but it uses the same techniques uh, to, to sort of inoculate people against them using more age appropriate content. Um, I won't go into um, too much detail. We have a COVID version just because it's, it's very relevant now. It's called Go Viral. Uh, we've done this with support from the World Health Organization and the United Nations, uh, as well as the UK government. And so it, it helps people spot strategies used to spread misinfo about COVID-19. And I think this links to maybe some of the things Steve was saying that the same techniques and the same actors that are present in climate denial are also present when it comes to COVID-19 denial. Um, 
And so a lot of the techniques of fake experts are being reused in conspiracy theories. Uh, so those are sort of the techniques that we alert people to. Uh, it works very much in the same way, like um, bad news. And so you start out as Joel and you know, oh, you need a quarantini. Um, and then you join this group called Not Co Frayed. It's, a, it's an online group. Uh, and then you're starting to spread conspiracies that uh, people are covering up evidence that eating kiwis cures the coronavirus. And so it takes you down a, a similar path and we just published a paper on, the, on this intervention uh, and sort of evaluating it. And so here you see that the same fake expert technique being used and we ask people how manipulative they find it. So, you know, Nobel laureate claims that the virus is not natural. There's evidence suggesting it's man-made. Um, and again, this is, uh, this is the fake expert technique. And so we ask people how reliable they find that. And again, in the within game, we find that people find it more manipulative, which is also true for every uh, technique individually, but for the control items, uh, for the real news items, there's there's no difference uh, um, on, on those items at all. Uh, we had a one week follow up here. And so we, we found the effect stayed pretty stable uh, for at least up to one week. We also tested some pre bunking infographics designed by the UN, which also worked uh, pretty well compared to control, which is kind of a passive inoculation. So it's a uh, people read it. Um, and so our game kind of worked better than the passive one, but both were useful in, uh, in sort of you know, pre-bunking some of the harmful content that people were seeing. We've done one with the uh, US government during the presidential election it's called Harmony Square. This is more focused on political misinformation and, and uh, how to spot foreign influence techniques and polarization. And so we use items that are very politically polarizing like, ooh, fathers don't deserve a day and Father's Day. Um, and and you know, we use sort of test items that are centered around political polarization. And you can see John Rosevich here with Cass Sunstein uh, at the UN presenting some of our uh, findings and the idea behind pre-bunking and vaccination. And we're currently working with uh, Facebook and, and WhatsApp and Google uh, to try to implement this approach at scale and to conduct studies uh, to learn more about how this might work on social media platforms. And together with John Cook, actually, we've been trying to we redesigned Facebook's uh, climate myth busting hub. Now at the present, they're just debunking. So we're trying to help them debunk as effectively as possible. Uh, but we're also kind of nudging them to consider the idea of pre-bunking and how you might do that. Um, and of course, um, you know, John Cook has launched Cranky Uncle, uh, which is a game that inoculates people against the rhetorical techniques of climate denial. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to leave that to John. I'm sure he has a wonderful uh, talk prepared that's going to go into much more detail about um, how he's applying this to the uh, world of, uh, of climate science and climate denial uh, in particular. Uh, and Cranky Uncle is also a gamified approach, of course, um, that kind of follows on from the from the uh, positive results that we've seen here with engaging people uh, through games, but we've also started to produce videos, animated videos. So the vehicle for inoculation could be anything. It doesn't have to be a game, it could be video, it could be infographics. Um, so there's diverse ways of actually doing that. The last thing I'll say, and I'm, I'm hoping to leave, you know, room for questions and debate and discussion rather than me just rattling on, is that, um, you know, what started out as a, as a cognitive vaccine uh, or the idea that you can immunize people one individual at a time is of course an interesting idea. But for me, it's all about the ultimate implication of the metaphor, which is herd immunity. How do you gain herd immunity against misinformation? Now for that, you need to know how many people you need to vaccinate in an online community psychologically in order to have uh, community resistance or societal resistance, uh, how long the effect lasts, uh, and also, um, to what extent, you know, what rate misinformation spreads. So we're currently building some computer models uh, with some cognitive scientists uh, using uh, input parameters from based on our research to see, you know, what percent of the population we need to reach in order to, to, to simulate some sense of herd immunity and how stable that might be uh, over time. So that's also kind of the exciting questions that we're asking next about how to actually um, scale this. Uh, because if enough people are vaccinated, the misinformation virus won't have a, a chance to, to spread. Um, so I'll end uh, my talk there. This used to be a joke uh, about Donald Trump that I would do in uh, tutorials, but of course he's, he's no longer president, but basically he was, he was tweeting, at Sander Vanderlin and your fake news vaccine sounds like hashtag total fake news. Also, what kind of name is Vander Linden? Way too many words. Um, but hopefully people would see that I've manipulated the Trump handle here. It's an N instead of an M. So now you've been immunized against the impersonation technique and you were inoculated and not duped by Donald Trump here. Um, so thanks so much and I look forward to your questions.
Thank you very much, Professor van der Linden, for that uh, talk and sharing with us uh, those creative approaches to uh, vaccinating and misinformation.